pray that uh, God will bless you and thank you for those who gave to the um, pastor appreciation. For those of you who weren't here, I want to give you a special thank you for all that you do and all that you have done for this ministry. As I was laying in bed this morning, I woke up at 3.12. I know it was that because I looked and I saw the clock. And the Lord began to minister to me and speak to me, and I don't know if I'll be able to relate it the same way that he related it to me, but it was awesome and it was just wonderful. And I just laid there for about an hour and 45 minutes uh, just listening to the voice of the Lord, just speaking to me um, what he wanted me to share with you this morning. And, and I hope it can come out the same way because it was just awesome. But I'll try my best as I am just flesh. But his word is alive and real. Amen. And so uh, it was just something that was in my, my mind and in my heart. And I said, well, it can't be me because I would not wake up myself at 3.12 in the morning and rehearse scripture in my mind and begin to speak to myself about these things. So um, what I want to share with you today is that God, amen, all you have to do is hit it once. It'll be there, trust me. Okay, that's all you have to do. The Word was made flesh. Did you touch it? Did you touch it? No, you shouldn't have touched it. I just said click it once. <laughs> okay. Anyway, God the Word was made flesh. Doesn't get, that doesn't excite you? You're all sitting there looking at me like zombies. Are you all tired this morning? Huh? Do you need to get up and exercise a little bit? Kind of shake, shake off the cobwebs? Come on, stand up everybody. Amen? Stand up everybody and just uh, you know, greet one another. Just go over and, and shake somebody's hand, give somebody a hug and you know, that'll get you going. That'll get the blood pumping. Someone you haven't seen for a while, go and, go and give them a hug. And Amen. Okay. Now that's got your blood pumping. My message this morning is God the Word was made flesh. Yes. Amen. I would like you to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. And at first it may seem like this has not got a thing to do with what I want to share this morning, but it does. Can you hear me okay? Everybody can hear me all right? Let me can turn this a little bit this way. Uh, let me just preface my message this morning with this. I have noticed by talking to different people and studying different things uh, throughout this past week that I'm noticing that there's a, a paradigm shift in how and what people believe. It's very interesting to note that a lot of people are, are uh, incorporating relativism in their Christian faith and in their Christian belief. And you know what relativism is. We talked about that before. Relativism is, is the belief that there are no moral absolutes. And though this message will not be on moral absolutes, it will be on God the Word was made flesh. And so if you have your uh, Bible open to Isaiah 55, I want to start reading, if you will please, from verse 6, and I'll just give Tom a moment to sh shift over to the, the rotating globe in my scripture. The Bible says, for first to seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him 
while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his what? Thoughts. Everybody's system of belief begins with thoughts. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Thoughts are very powerful, and thoughts will form and fashion what you think or what you feel as a Christian. And it says, let him, everyone say let him, return unto the Lord. It says that we should forsake, the unrighteous man should, uh, should forsake his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. So what that's saying to me is that people's thoughts that are, say, unsaved Christians or even some Christians need to get rid of the unrighteous thoughts that are not in accordance to God's word and God's will for your life. And he says, let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that wonderful news? God is there willingly ready to forgive and abundantly pardon us from our sins if we are willing to what? Forsake our own way and the right unrighteous thoughts that we have in regarding our relationship with God. And then he says this in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Is that, what we, is that where we are? Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Say it with me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. So before we, can, before we can form any kind of basis of theology or the study of God or the systematic study of God, we must first be able to have the thoughts that have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because the natural man, the Bible says, cannot understand the things which are spiritual. We have spiritual theologians and we have secular theologians. And many of the secular theologians are the ones that are in charge of many of the seminaries today. See, great schools that have developed throughout the years, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they were all at one time solid biblical Christian universities. And today are the most liberal universities in all the world. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. So what we need to do is we need to take our ways and make them hit the highways so that we can develop his ways. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I am so aware of not only in the, in the culture that we live in, but even in the, some of the thoughts in some of the Christian colleges and seminaries how they are applying relativism in their thinking and in their interpretation of Scripture. Some denominations are beginning to change what they believe the Bible says. And my question to some of them in one particular area, which I won't go into, is then for the last 70 years, if you believe something to be true, and now you're changing it and saying that it means something else. 
then you must admit to the public of the Christian church that for those 70 years you were wrong. Uh, you won't see that too much, too often. To see a university or a theologian re, that held something for 70 years say they're wrong. But it's not a matter of personal theology. It's not a matter of what I think or you think or what I believe versus you believe. I do not believe for one moment the Holy Spirit is schizophrenic or the Holy Spirit wants to cause confusion. Because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And therefore, if God is not the author of confusion, then the Holy Spirit cannot bring confusion to the teaching of Jesus Christ, whom Jesus said would speak of Him. So uh, I believe that the reason why you and I or many others may get a wrong interpretation of Scripture is because we're not exegetically taking the meaning out of Scripture, but we are actually putting our own meaning into the Scripture. It's called eisegesis in the study of theology. You're not taking the meaning out, but you're putting the meaning in. And this is very important. This is very important for you and I to understand because in the, in the days that we're living in, men will not give heed to, to sound doctrine, sound teaching. The reason why is this, is that sound doctrine is what has kept the church throughout the generations. But there had to be someone to proclaim that truth. There had to be someone who would give that truth to the church so that the church could continue on in those things that they have received. As I believe it was Jude says, giving an admonition to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Meaning that you and I or those who are teaching God's word, those who are uh, uh, taking God's word and explaining and expounding God's word, we must earnestly contend. That means to fight. That's a fighting word, contend. Because some people say, well, we don't want to argue about Scripture. Or, oh, we don't want to uh, discuss and debate Scripture. Well, we should when it comes to error trying to infiltrate truth. We should be able to debate that earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This may not sound too exciting to you, but I want you to know that this will form the basis of what you believe. So there's a question that we can ask. Are there moral attributes, uh, absolutes, I'm sorry. And by moral I mean this, what is right and what is wrong? Are there absolutes to find what is right and what is wrong? Because relativism is all in our society. It's in our colleges. It's in our universities. It's in our Christian circles. Just talk to somebody about the word, and within a few moments you'll be able to discern and understand what they believe, and why they believe what they believe. Give you an example. I remember one time having a conversation with Brother Bob Lewis. He was telling me about a friend of his. His father was a pastor. And he came out with this saying to Bob. He said, well, the, the Apostle Paul's words are not as powerful as the words of Jesus in red. So what he's saying is, is that truth is relative according to who you choose to believe. But I want you to know this morning that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, 
for instruction, for reproof, for correction. All of those things which I believe sometimes the church is not seeing. Because what has happened, there's been a paradigm shift from the 80s where the, the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the justice of God and the fear of the Lord was preached. There's been a shift over to emotional preaching. To stir just the emotions of people. And you can get those messages, and you can get high on those messages, and you can jump and you can shout and you can praise the Lord in your seat. But I want to tell you something, those messages will not last. See, because I can preach that way. I can preach the Pentecostal way. Or what they so seemingly call the Pentecostal way. You know, many of the churches consider the Pentecostal churches just a bunch of emotional, a bag of emotions. Because I can get excited. I can preach the word of God. Hallelujah. I can say, ha, 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 ha. And the Lord would say, ha, 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 ha. And get you all excited and moved, in the, and moved in, the, in the flush of things. But when it comes to the very solidity of your faith, being able to stand and give a reason of the hope that is within you. What can you say to a person that says, prove to me that there is a God? How do you know what you believe is the truth? How do you know that what you hold in your hand is the very word of God? How do you know that and how can you prove that? We don't. Have a mystical faith. We have a historical faith. Many say that there are no moral absolutes. And we live in a society today that dictates this belief. But God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. What you and I think about God may or may not be true based upon our philosophy, our ideology, or our experience in the interpretation of Scripture. The most common way that people interpret Scripture and if you talk to people they'll say, well the Scriptures are true but you know what? Everybody gets something different from it. This one will read this and believe this. This one will read the same thing and believe that. Well, I said the Holy Spirit does not cause confusion. But how are we going to decide what is real and what is truthful? is in how you interpret God's word. Now there is a group, which is very popular, that have been interpreting God's word this way, and, and you can see it also as it's coming out in the newer translations of the Bible. You're seeing more and more translations of the Bible coming out, for the simple fact is that they want to make money. Not that they're so concerned about truth, but they want the royalties from the money. And so what happens is, as you start to read some of the watered-down versions, or I would say the watered-down perversions, it's because of their, the way that they are interpreting Scripture. How they interpret scripture is very important. But the more and more you read these lukewarm versions that are coming out, you change one word, it changes the entire meaning. So let me give you just an example and then we're going to move on. One example is found in, in Ephesians, I believe it is, where Paul is talking to who? 
See how wonderful you are? You, you, are, you are good students. You've been listening. Paul was talking to the Ephesian believers, right? They were believers. I don't know unbelievers don't read the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. And he says to the, the Ephesians, he says, God who is in all is in, in all and in you all. Now the NIV Bible, in the very same scripture, says this, God who is in all, he says, and God who is all and in all. And they take that word you out. So a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Mormon, a Jehovah Witness can read that verse in Ephesians and say, you know what? God is in me. One of the, how many have ever heard this? We're all the children of God. Right? You've heard that? Well, where'd they get that from? Well, let's put a pre-qualifier on that. The pre-qualifier is this. God is the creator of all things. Okay. He is our creator. But we're only sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Because the, the Bible says in the Gospel of John, to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. So I don't care what the philosophers say. I don't care what the ideologist says. I don't care what Mormonism says. I don't care what Jehovah Witnesses says. I don't care what any of the cults say. I don't care what any of the other religions say. What does the word say? I don't care if they're the most pious person in the world. We're only God's children in the sense of him being our creator. But in relationship with God, we are not sons and daughters until we come through Jesus Christ. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Thank you. Amen. You say to me, well, pastor, if there are absolutes, if there are moral absolutes, such as right and wrong, prove it to me. Okay. If you turn in your Bibles, you don't have to. It'll be up on the screen to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning, someone once asked me, someone once asked, asked me this question. If you're so smart, tell me when the beginning was. And I said, it's easy, in the beginning. Very easy. When did the beginning begin? When he said so. In fact, it's a lot, it takes a lot more faith to believe that scientifically everything just popped into existence by chance. In other words, who can I pick on? Well, let's, I'll pick on Annie. Annie's 2014 or 13 Honda Accord. 13. New car, beautiful. Was found in a forest. Completely built. And she just went there and found the key, got in it, started it up and took it home. And to believe that that automobile just happened to be made through the process of eternity takes more faith than to believe that that automobile was created by intelligent design. That somehow behind that automobile there was intelligent design 
to make the blueprints of that car, send it to a manufacturer, and have those build that car according to the pattern that was made. It's a lot easier to believe that than it is to believe that somewhere in the, all the cosmos, all the universe, which is so stupid if you think about it, all of the universe, all of the planets, there are over one trillion times, one trillion times, one trillion to the trillionth power, and even beyond that, of stars, galaxies, and to think that everything in the universe became all compressed into the size of a dot. questions the intelligence of man in reality, if you think about it. Think about it. That's like taking the entire world and fitting every single person into a Volkswagen. To give you a little correlation between. It's more harder to believe that than it is to believe that in the beginning there was a person who is, his name is God who through his intelligent design made the heavens and the earth. What is your proof, pastor? We're here. It's amazing. In the Garden of Eden, God placed man. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone, so he gave him a woman. And the two of them were instructed by God, and, and the woman was instructed by Adam that out of all the trees they could eat, right? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were what? Forbidden to eat. That is the first sign. Hello? Of morality. The first sign given that there is right and wrong. There is moral absolutes. How do I know that to be a factual truth? Because God said that in the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And from the time of Adam all the way through, with a couple of exceptions, one Enoch, and the other Elisha. Every single person has died. Hello? Death is the very result of the first one who disobeyed the moral objective of taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is an absolute right there of morality of choice that what you and I choose there are consequences because yeah. man was not appointed to die we were to live forever in eternity with, with God in the garden and in his presence but because man fell we lost that So the objectivity that God had for us was to live in righteousness and peace with him. But because we disobeyed and we went and did our own thing, because the devil is the first one to bring relativity to humanity. Eve. God didn't mean what he said. There's not going to be a punishment. You shall not surely die. What's that? That's you take your own thoughts, Eve, and when you take of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to be like God. You're going to know both good and evil, so then you'll be able to make your own choices. That's relativism. Society and individuals are not to dictate what is right and wrong. 
You say, well, pastor, I don't believe that. We need to vote and we need to pass what's right and wrong. No. The Nazis did that. And they passed a law that if you were Jewish, you were to be exterminated. You were subhuman. And so what happened? When the times of Auschwitz and all the uh, concentration camps and the death of six million Jews happened, and then the world court took them to, to, to bring up charges against those officers, you know what their excuse was? It couldn't have been wrong. It was the law. That was the law. That they had to be killed. We were only following the law. That's why it is very dangerous for society to dictate what is right and wrong. What we need is absolutes like this right here to tell us what's right and wrong and therefore we can bring this into our belief system. God's word. You go into churches today, and, I, and I, I go and pray with pastors, and some of the pastors, they talk to me about, we talk about different things, and, and some of them say, you know, I have couples that are living together. They don't think anything about that. They come to church and lift their hands and praise the Lord. And they don't think anything of that. They think that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's relativism. When you take your thought and your thoughts and you pu apply them to the word and you make excuses and say, "Well, it, I think God understands." And you ladies, you give yourself wholly to a person who's not saved or who's not a Christian or who's not your husband. And you justify it by saying, but I'm in love with him. Or I'm in love with her. And I'm showing that person my love. No, you're not. What does God's word say? But we're living in a society that changes things, changes perspective, changes the way they think. But God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Don't put my imprimatur on your sin. And that's the whole gamut, the whole scope of your belief system. Oh, I don't need Bible study. Really? I don't need night of prayer. Really? The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. That means whenever the church is open, you should be there. Corporate prayer is needed. It's not an option. But your choices will determine your theology. Well, I don't see nothing wrong. That's right, you don't see nothing wrong. Because you're going by your thoughts, not this thought. This says when you come together to pray. Pray ye one for another. And I'm just using that as an example. There are many other secret little hidden things in our hearts that God wants to get at. So just from Genesis alone, we see that there are moral Hello? <laughs> there are moral absolutes that you and I will give an account for. Because it's not only what you say you believe, it's how you live. How you live will determine more loudly than what you say. Amen. The moment we decide what is right and what is wrong, we are headed toward believing in relativism. 
See, that's what Eve did. She taught. The Bible says she taught that it would make her wise. Hmm. We think we're wise without God. Let me say this about man. Man is very intelligent. Man has created some of the greatest things in life. Their ingenuity and their imagination has brought technology to a great, great help in society. Now here's my question. If we can believe that man can create all of these necessities and things of life, why is it that we take away the creativity of God? We're talking about a man whose intelligence of the greatest intelligence, Einstein or whoever you want to put there as one of the greatest thinkers of our time, doesn't even compare to the thoughts of God. God's thoughts are higher than that person's thoughts of whoever you think is more intelligent. What university you think is more intelligent. God is higher and greater than anything that you and I could ever think. And this little pea brain in here that I have can't even compare to know anything apart from what God has illuminated to me and to you. What God speaks to your heart, and here's my next point, and why the church gets in so much trouble in their theology and what they believe, is because they begin to interpret God's word subjectively. How many times I've heard a person say this, well, the Holy Spirit showed me. And I'll ask them, what did the Holy Spirit show you? And they'll tell me and I'll say, are you sure that was the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes. Because see, what happens is spiritual pride. Oh, I know when God speaks to me. Really? Okay. What does the Bible say? Test the spirit. So here's the test. We have to test whatever God supposedly speaks to us subjectively in our hearts or in our minds. We have to have proof that it is God, number one, and not ourselves, and that we're being delusioned into thinking God has said something when may in fact God may not have said anything at all. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, if we go only solely by the subjective thought that the Holy Spirit spoke to us, how do we prove that subjectivity to be real? Anyone have a thought? Yes. He said with the objectivity of the Bible. So when you go into the Bible and someone comes and says, I had a revelation. I was eating pizza and all of a sudden this light flooded into my room. It knocked me to the ground and a voice spoke to me through the pepperoni and said, Jesus is not God's son. Well, you can bet it was the pepperoni on that one. So how do, how do we prove that? How do we validify that to be God? I've had people say that people that do seances and, and read cards, fortune tellers, that that's a gift from God. That's a gift from the hell, the pit of hell. But they believe it's from God. How can it be from God when he says it's an abomination in the word? He detests that. So we have to use the objectivity 
of instruction and of how we can come to the knowledge of the truth. And that comes, and well, how can we prove that? Well, let me ask you this. When the Holy Spirit decided, okay, that our God decided, let me put it that way, that he was going to write down everything in the Bible for us to understand it. How did he do it? Hmm? The Holy Spirit through men? But what did he do? Did he write it in tongues? What was the format that God used to communicate to us so that you and I could understand in the illumination and revelation of God, of course? But how would we understand it? Yes. Human language. You say, okay, pastor. But we understand that the, the, the word wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and some Aramaic. But mostly Hebrew. Mostly Greek. Then it's imperative for those who want to be teachers of God's word to be a student of the natural language. You don't have to be a professor. There are plenty of helps. But you have to be able to rightly discern and rightly divide the word of truth like the Bible says. So in that, we go into the word and we see, does the word say this? There are many examples flowing through my head right now, but I, I don't want to use them because it will take up too much time. But how you know is, first of all, what does the text say? The text is a scripture, and it must be interpreted through the context of everything that's being said before it, after it. I told you this lady one time. I wasn't a pastor at the time. I was just a, I was a you know, church goer like you are. And I would go to church, and I remember this lady telling this pastor and said, God spoke to her. Now listen to this. True story. God spoke to her and told her to divorce her husband and that she was going to marry this other pastor. And the scripture she used for validification was this. He taketh away the old to establish the new. There's a scripture like that. But do you see how she applied that? She took it out of its context, applied it to her situation. That's what's called a pretext. Because it's out of context, and therefore it's false. What was the scripture talking about? The old covenant and the new covenant. Had nothing to do with personal divorce and husbands and remarrying. Had nothing to do with that. But how you interpret it is by the original language because sometimes, sometimes, we don't understand a certain word. Like I said, one little word can change the whole meaning. See, Jehovah Witnesses take John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That changes the entire meaning. That Jesus, which was the Word that became flesh, became a God. He wasn't always God. He became God. Now, how do you prove to a Jehovah Witness that's not true? From your Bible. When they're telling you that the original text says that was a God was in the original Greek. How do you prove that? Huh? You go back to John 1.1 1, 1 in the Greek. The, the King James Bible was written by the Texas Receptus. And you go back to John 1.1 1, 1, and you see that there is, first of all, no indefinite article A in the Greek. 
There's an A, but no indefinite article. And you go back and you read it in the original. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with Theos, and the Logos was Theos. Was God. Was not a God. I went, to a Jehovah, I went to a meeting one time, and I had my Bible and my book with me. I had my Bible with me. And one of the Jehovah Witness elders got up. It was a meeting at my cousin's house. She asked me to come, and I went. And they got up, and they said, well, I want to make one thing clear, first and foremost. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Because the definite article is there. So I raised my hand. And I asked a question. I says, explain to me, please, what a definite article is. And they looked at each other. And they said, we don't know. So I says, you are making an assertion that Almighty God in his word, is stating that his son is a God and you don't even understand or know what, an, what a definite article is. How do you know you're right? Have you looked in the original manuscripts? Oh, yes. I said, you're a liar. Because in the original manuscripts, it's not a God. It's simply God. I says, if you go back and you're honest, if you're really honest with your interpretation skill and you go look at that scripture, you will find that it says he is the theos. He is God. Amen. He's not a God. Okay, so let's... Let's say that you want to prove what the Bible says is true. I think you'll be convinced by the very society which we live in. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end, their way, uh, the end thereof are the ways of death. So many Hundreds of thousands of millions of people have slipped out into eternity without Christ because of the lies and the hypocrisy of some religions and some cults and some occultic, some of the uh, New Age philosophies and ideologies and mental telepathy and uh, all this uh, thinking stuff that's out there. Millions have been lost in eternity. But Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth is what we're after. Amen. Not our opinions, not our school philosophy. What is the truth of God's word? Okay, so now you need further proof. Some of you need more proof. You need some kind of evidence. You need someone who knows for sure if there is or isn't a valid proof of moral absolutes. And as I said before, although this message is not about absolutes per se, it will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is, was, and always will be who he said he is. Do you believe with me that God knew that people from all generations would need proof? So what did God do to prove it? Huh? Getting warm. You're still warm. No. 
No. You're only in the warm stage. If I was to ask you, what is the title of my message? What was the title? Huh? God, the Word, was made flesh. Isn't that what I said? There it is right there. Watch it. God, the Word, was made flesh. We have an eyewitness. We have an eyewitness to creation. So if you're ever talking to anyone out there, say, how about if you had an eyewitness to creation? Would you believe them? If you had an eyewitness that was there at the time when everything was created, would you believe it? Would you believe it? Well, you have one. Go to John 1, 1, please. I want to read that. Is this helping anybody? Yes. I'm really trying the best I can, but it, it just flowed so wonderfully. What? Yes. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, when was that? Genesis, Genesis 1 1. Hello? In the beginning, Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, watch this. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. He was there during creation. Eyewitness. Verse 3. All things were made by him. This should erase any doubts of anyone's mind. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, verse 4. In him was life. How did the word create all things? God said, and I've got that underlined in my Bible everywhere in the beginning of Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And it was so. The word was the creator. Out of the word came forth and created. All things were created by him and for him and through him. And nothing that was made was not made without him. In him was life. And the life, listen to me, in him was life. How he lived on this earth is a great example and image of who God is. So we have concrete evidence and proof. Jesus said many times, the things that I say unto you, they're not my words, they're my Father's words. The things that I do, they're not what I want to do, it's what the Father wants me to do. He lived the example and show forth in his divine nature, in his human nature, who God was. That's where people get confused between the two natures. They don't know when God is speaking as the word in Christ 
and they don't know when Jesus as a person is speaking. And then they get it confused. In him was life. The life that he lived breathed forth life to you and me. And the life was the what? The light of men. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let me say it again. Thy word. The beginning was the word and the word was with God. Is a lamp unto my feet. What happens when you're in a dark alley or you're in a dark place and you have no light? You stumble a little bit. You might trip over something. You grope away around because you can't see. But the moment you have light, it brings direction and instruction to your heart to know what to do. Yeah. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Yeah. I know which directions to go and what path to walk in. And I know what paths not to walk in. Romans 11, verse 33 to 36. Oh... This is the Apostle Paul, of course. And he's saying, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depths. Every time we think we know something, God brings us a little more revelation. Always remember, let your uh, revelation be subjective to the objective. I had a revelation. Oh, it could have been too, much, too many meatballs. Make sure your revelation is in co cooperation to the objectivity of God's word. Oh, the depth of the riches. God has riches. The depths of those riches are found in him. I believe it's in Philippians, he says, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Whew. We have this treasure. Where do you find treasure? On the surface? It's buried. And if you want to open up the treasure chest of God's knowledge and God's word and God's ways, you must open up the treasure chest of his word and read that word and study that word and eat that word and get it in you because there may come a time when churches are no longer allowed to meet. If you... Teach, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. What I'm trying to instruct you is to learn how to eat on your own and to be fed on your own. So if anything ever happens in this society, you will know how and what to do in order to get God's revelation and his word to you. All oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God is awesome. And you know, it just, it just irks me to see sometimes people think that they know more than God. Or they stand in their pride and their arrogance thinking that they have this super knowledge that maybe we don't have and we know and you don't know. And I challenge them. Take what you know and bring it up against the hundreds and thousands that are out there that
that have higher degrees in theology and look at what they are saying and examine it according to the scripture and look at the scripture itself. But people pull away from that. I told you, objective truth. Ways of examining. God wrote the Bible, but he wrote the Bible. Listen to me now. He wrote the Bible in words, letters, words, sentences, paragraphs. If you don't think so, look at your Bible. That's how he chose to communicate. So if you want to know God, if you want to see God, if you want more of God, get into the Word. This should be a desire in you, and if there is not a desire in you, you better check where you're coming from. Because the more you want to know this God, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how great and unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, and I'll close with this. Speaking of Christ, who is, not maybe, not could be, who is the image of the invisible God. You want to know more about God? Read the life of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read what the apostles wrote about him. Read about what the disciples wrote about him. Read about, we say, well, that's the New Testament, then I can forget the Old Testament. No, 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 no. Christ said that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they spoke of me. Go back and look and read, and the illuminating light of the Holy Spirit and the light of the New Testament will bring the Old Testament to revelation. I like to say it this way. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Hallelujah. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now see, go back to that scripture one time, Pastor Tom. Many people take this scripture out of context and they say, see, Jesus had to be born again. He was the firstborn. It's true. Many people take this scripture out of context and say that Jesus had to be born again. I say that's heresy. In order for a person to be born again, it means that they're a sinner. That disqualifies Christ because he wasn't a sinner. He was the firstborn of every creature to die and rise again. He was the first one to live for everlasting, to everlasting. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. That's the cosmos. The stars, the planets, hello, the galaxies, the sky, the rain, the snow, the sun, the heat, the cold. All that are in heaven that are in earth, visible and invisible. Oxygen. Gravity, hello, those are invisible until you defy them. <laughs> then they become reality. <laughs> if you don't think so, hold your nose and keep your mouth shut. You'll see the reality of oxygen come into very clear perspective. Jump out of a plane with no parachute. You will see the law of gravity. 
in effect. He got detriment. <laughs> Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. You were not created for yourself to live a selfish life. Your life was given to God and you, your life was given to here on earth so that you could glorify God and bring glory and honor to his name. And how you do that is with the highest integrity and honesty of treating his word with respect and honor. That's why I hate it when I see somebody put the Bible on the floor. I'm not being superstitious. But you ever do that in the sight of a Jew, they will disdain you. They keep the scrolls in a cabinet because they love God's word. They honor God's word. We throw it on the floor, we step on it, we sit on it, we do all kinds of crazy things. To understand what it took for that Bible to be in your hand. took a man who wrote two-thirds of that New Testament to be in prison in the cold, dark, wet, damp prison in chains to write those letters to those churches and then at the end of that time to go out before the uh, Caesar of, the, uh, of Rome and to have his head cut off was the Apostle Paul. And you and I have the privilege of having that word, two-thirds of the New Testament, of the suffering and the pain and the sorrow of loneliness, discouragement, perplexity, that this man suffered so that you could have that Bible, the New Testament, in your hands. Oh, for the riches of the wisdom and knowledge that are found in God. So it is imperative for you and I to know that what we think about God must line up to what God's thoughts are in his word. The Bible says God is of purer eyes that he cannot behold evil. It will change your perspective on how you live. It will change your perspective on what you do. And it will change your perspective on how you speak. If you truly are believing the scriptures, and I mean not just believing with an easy believism, oh, I believe, but you believe it with every fiber of your being to the point where you want everything that word has for you, and you want to get rid of everything that that word says to get rid of in your life. There are moral absolutes. But we must have our thoughts changed to his thoughts. How do we do that? If you could just put one more scripture up there, it just came to my heart. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Shall we stand when we read this scripture together? Closing. I think this is an area where the church has been so guilty of thinking that their thoughts are God's thoughts. By being conformed to this world, the church is not in obedience to God's thoughts. He says, and be not conformed to this world. How the world thinks, how the world dresses, what the world says, what the world does. But be what? Transformed. How? 
By the renewing of your mind. What goes into your mind? Thoughts, words, sentences. What's the purpose that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life? Let's pray. Father, I hope I've done you justice. I hope, Lord, that I was able to convey what you said to me today. I pray, Lord, that we will take your word seriously. That God, you were made flesh. You were made flesh. So that we wouldn't have to just wonder what this abstract God was all about. But you became flesh in the person of Christ. And through his life, we see that in him was eternal life. And he is the light of men. And by receiving him, God, we have the light. Help us, Lord, to let this light so shine. Let this light be a path to understanding the objective word. Not that you can't speak subjectively to us, you can. But it almost always has to be tested by the objective word. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to be good students of your word. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not just for pastors. Help us, Lord, to know your word in its purity. To know your word, Father, and not take it out of context. Help us to let us be an example of what biblical Christianity is all about. To this generation. Lord this young generation. Is looking for answers. They're not looking so much for us. To identify with them. But to be able to show them. Why there is a difference. And so father we ask in Jesus name. That you will continue to speak to our hearts. And to our minds. And help us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can prove what is the good, perfect, acceptable will, which is what you have for our life. And Lord, thank you for the absolutes, the moral absolutes, that it's not according to what I think, but it's according to what you said. And we'll give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. Now, Father, I ask a blessing upon your people. Thank you for their attentiveness. Thank you for their willingness to come and listen. Father, I've done the best I could. I pray, God, that it will go into their spirit man. And in their spirit man, they will regurgitate it up into their minds. And they will chew, and they will chew, and they will chew, and begin to find the pleasures of your word and the pleasures of what's found in there. Because how unsearchable are your riches and wisdom. Bless them as they go. Be with them. Surround them with your holy angels. Give them traveling mercies, we pray. Until we all come together in obedience to your word once again, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning.